Eastern, Eastern, I introduce myself. I'm Councillor Goma, uh, Councillor Richard Goma. I'm the Chair of Policy and Performance Scrutiny. Um, the first thing we need to do is just in case my internet goes down during this meeting, uh, we need to uh, have in place uh, a nominated fullback, which is our Vice Chair. Uh, and since uh, Councillor Cross isn't actually in this meeting, uh, I would like to propose that we nominate uh, Councillor Tyson Payne as a temporary vice chair just for this meeting. Um, and I'm going to take silence as agreement. So if anyone would like to disagree, please unmute yourselves and say so. Can I just say that Councillor Cross has actually just sent a message saying, have I joined the meeting yet? Um, OK. I propose we still uh, nominate Councillor Tyson Payne and um, I don't know if someone can just sync up with Councillor Cross and try to get him in. Um, but we will carry on. Um, so uh, let's introduce uh, everyone who is uh, on the panel. Uh, so I'm just going to switch to the people I want to introduce themselves. So uh, Councillor Asman, if you could just give us a wave and say hello. I can't hear you, you're muted. Sorry about that, Councillor Asman, member for West End South. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Broadhurst. Uh, Councillor Alan Broadhurst. Councillor Cauldry. I'm Nick Cauldry. I'm back, but I still can't get onto the chat function. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Duguid. Good evening, Councillor Duguid for Hiltingbury. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Grievski. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Councillor Judith Grievski. Uh, Councillor Groves, it's like. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Groves from Chandler's Ford. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jurd. Hello, good evening. Councillor Lucy Jurd for Hedge End North. Uh, we're joined this evening by Councillor Curl, who is not a member of the committee, but is portfolio holder uh, for the environment and has joined us because he's going to speak, but I'll ask him to say hello if he's there uh good evening everybody councillors uh members of the public offices um uh, councillor rupert curl councillor for botley and cabinet member for the environment thank you chair thank you uh councillor pracknell good evening councillor dave pracknell representing channels ford thank you councillor tidridge Hello, um, Councillor Tidridge. Um, I represent Bishop Stoke. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tyson Payne, our temporary vice chair. Uh, good evening, uh, Councillor Sarah Tyson Payne, uh, Eastley North. Thank you. Um, and the officers who we have with us tonight are Natalie Wigman and Jason Light. Right, let me put myself live. <sighs> It's like a game trying to find the right video to put live, but there we are. Um, I have apologies uh, from Councillor Dogwe, uh, but no others. Uh, Councillor Cross is due to join us uh, once we figure out those technical issues. Um, so uh, members, you're invited to declare uh, interest in relation to items of business on the agenda. Uh, any interest declared will be recorded in the minutes. Does anyone need to declare any interests this evening? Yes, I do. I should have done so earlier. I do apologise for not yeah. having done so earlier. Um, I'd like to declare an interest in the COVID-19 item. Um, I am actively involved in Eastleigh Community Aid. I do administration and organisation for them. They're one of the voluntary groups, which is part of the um, LRC. Thank you. Um, any more? Uh, yes, uh, Chairman, this is uh, uh, Councillor Grajewski here. Um, I should like to de declare an interest in the COVID item and also agenda item eight, which refers to health and well-being, as I'm the executive member for public health at Hampshire County Council. Thank you. And Councillor Tyson Payne. Yes, I, 
I think I may need to declare uh, an interest. I'm a volunteer for one community, so I'm not sure if that counts or not. So, well, yes, better to declare things than yeah, not. Yeah, absolutely. For that. Any more for any more? No, we will move swiftly on. So the first item you have on the agenda tonight uh, is to consider the minutes of the meeting that were held on the 12th of March 2020, uh, which have been published on the web and circulated ahead. Um, I don't think there are any matters arising. Councillor Krajewski, you'd like to speak. Yes, thank you. Sorry, so much typing and so many buttons to press. <laughs> Just on um, page four of the of the minutes, uh, it's at paragraph 84, Cabinet Forward Plan. Yeah. The second bullet point, uh, a report was to be carried out with regards to the corporate plan and be made available for July's meeting, along with capital review and so on. Um, we obviously haven't got the, the corporate plan yet yeah. for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, however, uh, given that there's already been some slippage, as far as I can see, on the 1920 plan, mm -hmm. and in the next agenda item seven, which is your um, item, Chairman, yep. uh, paragraph 6.f uh, refers to it as being a tool for us to do our planning at this committee. I think it would be helpful to have a date on that before the year disappears. Yes, um, we have discussed it. Natalie, could you give us an update of when that's likely to be able to come? I think you're muted. So yeah, we're, we're working on it at the moment. Um, hopeful that it, it might come to, to July, but there are some key things that we do need to check because obviously the situation that we've originally done with that plan has changed quite a bit um, in the COVID situation. So if not July, September, um, but I should be able to formalise the date soon and then we can adjust that on the work plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, I agree we want to see that because it does help with our work planning and it's going to help us um, get this other item about um, doing our portfolio scrutiny as well. Um, and we can talk through how I think we have to take the work plan this year when we get to that item on the agenda. Um, was there anything else arising from the minutes or any corrections? Otherwise, I'm going to take them as agreed. No, so if I'm not seeing anyone shout. So uh, we will move swiftly on to. Uh, there's no public participation, so we're going to skip that uh, to the chair's report. And it really just falls to me to say, I think, um, thank you all for making this meeting. Obviously, we're still learning how we go. Um, I think most of us have been in uh, virtual meetings now and are getting the hang of it. Um, and actually, it's a testament to how how hard I think IT and DEM services have worked to get us to this point. Um, so I'd like to put my thanks on record to them. In terms of business for the committee, um, obviously we had some task and finish groups in swing. Um, the big one uh, that I guess was due to come back was um, health and social, uh, which um, for obvious reasons hasn't made much progress. A, because it's been difficult to meet uh, and B, because obviously the health team have been busy with um, response to COVID-19. Um, so we will pick that up again once we are able to get some officer time. Um, I would like, if possible, uh, anyone who's interested in joining the housing task and finish group, that is one I think we can still progress uh, to, to please let me know. Um, I did have a couple of volunteers. One or two more would be great because there's some interesting um, policy there that we need to develop where we can add some value. Um, and Sarah's just informed me that Councillor Cross has joined. Uh, Malcolm, do you have any declarations of interest that you need to declare? No, no, I haven't. I just had a job trying to connect up to it because it just wouldn't, I just couldn't get you going. No, I haven't. Fabulous, thank you. Um, Anything on the chair's report anyone would like to pick up? Otherwise. Yes, Malcolm. I think it was a very thorough report and I think everybody contributed well in the past year and I think it's very thorough and a good way looking forward. Thank you. I think we've got ahead of ourselves there and that will be the scrutiny action plan, but it's nice to have some validation in advance. Um, 
no one else has asked to speak. So um, the first sort of item we've got for discussion uh, is the COVID-19 update, which I think Natalie was going to briefly run us through. You're muted. Thank you, apologies. It's because I'm used to doing all the talking. I forget <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm muted that I've got to turn it back on. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to take you through the report in detail. Obviously, you've all, you've all seen the report and, and it has previously gone to Cabinet. The, the reason it's come to us tonight is more for information and to give you an opportunity to engage in the recovery process to, to seek, um, sorry, and the, the COVID-19 process, but particularly for us, I think the interest is around recovery, um, where we'll be looking at kind of policy and strategy development as a result of changes through, through COVID-19. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask questions, but I will just give you a summary um, around the recovery work, um, which I think, as, as I said, is the one that has kind of the biggest implications for us as, as a committee. We've split the Council's recovery work into two parts. Um, one is looking internally for, for Eastleigh Borough Council itself, so the organisation and, and how it runs. And the other is to look um, externally um, in the community um, and the impact of COVID-19 um, on things like residents, businesses, um, sports groups, people's health. Um, but it is, it is the out outward facing side. Um, on the internal side of that work, um, we've got a number of work streams running. Um, we've got one which is about responding to essential services. So it's looking at the things that, that we've closed down, that we, we had to close down during um, certain parts of the, the response where we weren't able to run certain services, but actually relaxation of rules has mean we can start bringing some of that back. So we're looking at bringing back those services that, that, that we now have the opportunity to, to do. Some of that is around kind of physical work, visits to people's homes, that sort of thing. Um, the other part of that work is around looking at what we can learn um, from from the current situation. We've been working in a way that, that none of us ever thought was possible for the last three months. So it, it's what, what we've learned from that, what we might be able to do better going forward, what, you know, what hasn't worked. Um, so that's a key part of, of that work as well. Um, we're also looking at the actual response we've done. So how we've responded to this situation. Are there things we could have done better? Um, are there lessons that we need to learn? Uh, again, internally, there's key consideration around health and well-being. Um, had a big, this situation had a big impact um, on, our, on our staff. Um, and we're needing to make sure that, that we manage that very well. So we've got um, a work stream looking at that as well. In terms of the, the outside facing, the community um, recovery element of the work, um, we're linking in with the Local Resilience Forum. This manages the COVID-19 response across the whole of the county and the Isle of Wight um, to make sure that we're, we are very much in line um, with what's happening across the county. Um, but also to make sure we're focusing on what's important to us locally. So we don't have to follow um, any county guidelines. We're just making sure that we're not missing anything critically um, that they've put forward. Um, key areas we're looking at are things like the economy, again, health and well-being um, and the impact on, on the wider on the wider borough. Um, we're looking at kind of the impact on community groups, think people, groups like parish councils, um, and how we can um, kind of facilitate a, a return to normal or, or a new normal. Um, in some instances, we, we can have direct control over that. It might relate to a service that we run, but in many instances, it's not something we have direct control over. So it's, it's how we can support existing groups, um, for example, working closely with businesses, um, linking in with government, the local enterprise partnerships, trying to identify funding routes, um, and adding resource where we where we can, but so that might be um, through through staff participating um, in, in workshops shops or helping to develop um, projects going forward. So it's not all areas that that we can control directly. Um, that is it in a really short nutshell. But obviously, um, ask me any any questions around that for, for more detail. And in terms of what we do next, as I said, at the moment, we're very much in a response phase. We're still responding to this crisis, um, but in more and more, we're looking at how we recover as well. And the two things are running simultaneously. 
um, but we will get to a point where recovery is our is our key focus um, as, our, as our response um, slows down. And I think there is a real opportunity then for um, policy and performance to to get involved and to take part in um, kind of the, the development of, of the new normal really um, for, for the council and potentially some of our policies which are more outward facing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to take uh, questions from Jin and then Judith. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I was really pleased to see in um, section 27 a reference to furloughing. I'm very glad that um, the decision was taken to furlough um, some employees who were initially told that they were going to be laid off. So I'm very, very pleased that they were furloughed instead. That was good to see. Um, from a policy and performance perspective, though, I just want to make sure that um, we're talking about recovery, but obviously there is a very strong risk of there being a second wave um, and also a possibility of local lockdown if there is a local um, second wave. Um, and it's ensuring that we've got learnings from the first wave, if you like, that will help us to become more resilient to the second. Um, one of the areas, for example, which we're talking about here is the LRC, which I do have a little bit of knowledge of, so I have to declare an interest there. But um, I know from um, the organisation I'm involved with, we've seen a massive drop off in volunteers recently, huge drop off in volunteers. That's simply because everybody's going back to work. People don't have the time anymore. Uh, although we're seeing a, seeing a de decrease as well in, in requests for help, the two things aren't necessarily going completely proportionate to each other. Yeah. Um, so I think that's possibly a risk that the LRC might need to consider going forwards and possibly that's something to consider in this document and how it develops going forwards. Um, the other thing um, I was surprised not to see in this document is anything about um, the um, what, I've, what I've heard anecdotally, which is um, I was told by an officer that the number of nuisance complaints had gone up about threefold over um, the lockdown period, in particular complaints about noise and complaints about smoke from bonfires and barbecues. Um, mm -hmm. It's simply because people are just living that much closer to each other. They're at home the whole time. They're going to be winding up each other a lot more. Anecdotally, I heard that was the case. It would have been it would be good to see in this document something about um, how the council has been responding to that, um, particularly seeing as there was um, criticism um, on social media about um, residents feeling that they weren't being listened to um, when they raise these kind of complaints um, and whether or not that really was the case of course social media isn't always 100% accurate as we all know um, but it would be good to see um, how the council has been responding to helping residents live happily with their neighbours um, during the lockdown period um, as well as everything else in the report but um, it's a it, it's a it's an impressively comprehensive report. Great. Um, there's some really good points. Natalie, can you just talk us through those ones before we go to Judith? Yes, of course. Um, in terms of a uh, second wave and kind of preparing for that, it's something we are very acutely aware of. Um, as I say, we engage, engage with the local resilience forum where we're getting uh, lots of uh, data um, and kind of modelling and planning um, to help us kind of make those decisions. What we've asked staff to do is to prepare for a second wave. So to go away, think about what the impact has been the first time round, what the impact will be if that happens again. And bearing in mind, a lot of this is cumulative. Um, people have been working under a lot of pressure for a long period of time. Um, so we, we are doing what we can now to plan as far in advance for something that um, we, we, we have a, a chance of planning for, whereas the first time round, obviously, um, we, we didn't act quite so much. So we are doing that work and we are, very, we are very, very aware of that. And that is a key part of our recovery process at the moment in terms of helping us kind of decide what we do bring back and what we don't bring back, because we're very aware that it might only be for a short term kind of period and we might have to change again. So it, it is it's, it's playing a critical part in, in our planning process. Um, I note what you're saying around volunteers dropping off that that is a concern and again I don't have the answer now but that is part of our our consideration um, that's also part of what I was saying about it being cumulative because people have been volunteering for a long period of time so we don't have all those answers now but we are aware of the issue and we're, we're doing a lot of research and planning to try and make sure that we're as equipped to deal with that as we can. In terms of um, complaints um, particularly around kind of noise and smoke, as, as you've alluded to, um, where we have um, a, a direct kind of duty and ability 
um, to respond. Um, we've been doing so as long as we can in a safe fashion. Obviously, we, we still have issues around um, not being able to kind of access people's homes and obviously making sure our, our staff are, are safe at all times. But, but where we do have that direct duty, um, we have been we have been responding. Um, the barbecue and bonfire issue is a difficult one. Um, we don't have um, we can't kind of intervene in, in, in every kind of, kind of smoke incidents there. there there's very clear um, kind of parameters on from pollution in terms of what we can and can't get involved in. But we but we have been trying to work really hard in terms of our messaging on social media to discourage um, the use of kind of bonfires at, at this time. Um, we've even done some work with um, local retailers um, to to ask them to kind of um, to not to promote um, the sale of things like fire pits at the moment and ask them to display um, signage around residents behaving responsibly um, at, at this time um, because we, we know it is an issue and it is a, is a concern for residents. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Grayevsky, I think you'd like to speak as well. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have it's about three points to make, but I have a question first, if I may, may ask um, uh, Natalie. At paragraph seven of the report at the top of page 11, it refers to the um, LRF um, and members uh, including two county councils. Now, as far as I'm aware, Hampshire is the only county council that's part of the Hampshire LRF. Did you have another one in mind? I, I, I did ask a colleague at the county this afternoon and they couldn't think who you might mean. I can respond to that, Richard, if you'd like me to. Yes, please. Yes, you're, you're right, that, that is a mistake. There is only one county council. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't noticed one suddenly kind of creep, creep up somewhere, so you, you, you're completely right. I think there are more than one um, unitary authority on that, which is, is what that, that exactly which what that's alluding to. So we've got both the cities, Portsmouth, Southampton and the Isle of Wight, as well as the County Council. And then you've got the district. So, yes, that is that is wrong. I do apologise. Thank, thank you. I, I just had to ask because I first noticed it when I, I read the report five weeks ago ahead of Cabinet, um, which brings me on to the point that it is a good report, but it's woefully out of date um, and uh, things are changing on a daily basis. I know that at Hampshire, when people are asking me for figures and what are we doing about things, I don't give them the answer I heard yesterday because it might have changed today and that's how fast moving things have been. For instance, um, the Grayson site uh, at the airport, uh, I believe, is uh, if it's not being dismantled, it's all it's in the process of being dis dismantled now. Um, there obviously has been an impact on services and I fully understand that because of the social distancing, people having to self isolate and so on. But I think it would be good to get a report um, where we can actually quantify the impact on services. For instance, um, the hours worked and call outs uh, delivered by pest control, uh, the non collection of bulky waste, uh, delays in transport and engineering plans, which I've encountered, um, any, delay, any delays in validation of planning applications, and uh, a reduced grass cutting and street cleansing service. As I say, I, I understand why this has happened, but I think we need to be able to quantify it um, so that uh, it would help us with any future planning. Um, uh, the other thing I'll come back to, Councillor Tidridge raised about local lockdown. Um, a local lockdown is not going to be um, we're going to close off easily, at least God, I hope it isn't going to be we're going to close off easily. Um, track and trace is being um, um, managed um, locally. Um, uh, the uh, public health director at the county council is uh, li liaises with um, Public Health England on that. And uh, I, I know from the figures that I get that uh, people are being Track, tracked and traced incredibly quickly um, and we've got a, you know there's a huge team of people working on that and where there is going to be any lockdown decisions will be taken by public health um, and it will be a matter of maybe closing down a school or closing down a workplace or a factory or something like that uh, it, it, may, it may not even I think involve a, a, a whole place of employment if it's a, a large place of employment. So it's going to be very, very concentrated and specific um, alongside the uh, the proactive track and trace work that's going on. Um, and that I think is all I've got to say. Thank you, Chairman. 
Fabulous. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting um, addition. Um, on the, 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 the impact side, some of that I think will come next meeting where we've got uh, two quarters of performance data to come. Um, we could have had quarter three this meeting, but I did ask to defer it to the next one because actually I think that will be an interesting comparison um, between those two quarters. Um, we, I don't know if any of the officers present can speak to how we might be able to get a look at that impact data or that quantification. Yes, I can. That would be great, thank you. We have been monitoring um, the impact on services throughout, so so we do have some information about that. The and we can, and I think the most sensible thing to do is to probably add a section to the performance report next time to to give the information that and th that there might be additional KPIs that aren't in the normal one that might be useful to you. So I think that's probably the best way forward. Yeah, can, can I respond, please, to that, Chairman? Yes, of course. In, in, in that I, th I think we need to know, you know, was I go around and think, gosh, you know, look at the height of that grass or uh, look at that. I, I, I need to know what is COVID related and what is just mm. somebody's forgotten to do it. And if we can quantify it, give me some idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, so that's the aim to try and get that into the, the performance data then. Um, and I guess in the meantime, as members, if we notice that we, we, we can ask directly uh, the relevant department whether it's just an oversight or or an impact. Um, Councillor Asman, I've got you down to speak next. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's in respect of section 41 of the report, which refers to the uh, borough-wide flyer was set, which was sent for delivery by Royal Mail, which included um, messages about service uh, changes, support for vulnerable people, financial support and other things. Um, I think we're all aware that we were very badly let, let down by Royal Mail and in fact there were a great numbers of these flyers which were not in fact delivered. It has given me concern throughout that it's not necessarily only older persons, um, but there are many people out there that still are not connected to the internet and don't have email. Um, and they do get left out, I'm afraid. Um, they're not aware of what is happening. Um, they get terribly frustrated when they hear somebody on the television saying, and you can see this on, and they're not capable of getting at it. I don't know what the answer is, but I do think it needs it really does need looking at um, so that we we don't leave these people out a bit in the same way as, as school children who don't have computers so that they can access their their schoolwork in situations like this. Thank you, Chair. And that's a really good point. Um, digital inclusion. Obviously, it's like we need to think about really hard during business as usual as we as we put things online and I think we saw a little element of that with the bin calendars um, but now that that we're so reliant on that and um, things like access to democracy um, to council services um, is an issue I don't know what we could do about it either and I don't know if any of the officers have anything to add um, or if maybe this is something we need to look at in a little bit more detail Oh, Natalie, are you talking? You're muted. And we'll get the hang of it. I can, I can give a brief response. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it is a real challenge and it is it's such a shame that we did have the issues we had with the, the flyer to all residents because that that obviously was um, our main um, kind of route to getting into every single household. Um, it, it is really difficult. We do do um, things like Borough News on, on a general basis. We, we chose to do the flyer because we thought it would be quicker to get information out to everybody. Obviously, that there was there was problems with that, um, but we are still looking to do things like um, our normal online, our normal um, physical publications. But one of the other key ways is by sending information out through different groups. So we, we do try to use um, kind of different channels that are already in communication um, with with 
people that may not have access to the internet so such as kind of working with groups like one community and our parish councils and some of our other community groups but it, it is a real really difficult issue and and it, it might be worth some further consideration by the committee thank you natalie um i'm inclined to agree it might be something that that we need to look at a bit more um I'm not sure what the best way to do that is. I'm just going to make a note on the work program item at the end. Think about digital inclusion, especially. And we pick that discussion up a little bit later. Um, Malcolm, I think you wanted to speak. Let's send you live. Thank, thank you. Um, reference um, Councillor Tidridge talked about uh, drop in volunteering. Uh, in Hamble, we've we've got a recovery plan working group, and I had a word with one community, and G uh, thinks that because the furlough is going down and people may be losing their jobs, you think the volunteering may increase because of people uh, be wanting something to do. So she she is quite fed, well fairly confident that. Um, it may pick up again. So I just thought I'll mention that. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, and then Jid, I think you wanted to speak again as well. Yes, please. Um, Malcolm, very sadly, that really hasn't been the case. We've certainly, we've certainly seen that a lot of our um, volunteers are now going back to work. I mean, I'm, I'm very much in that category as well. And just trying to juggle um, everything just means, means you don't have enough time to be able to volunteer like you did. Um, just one point really going back to what um, Councillor Asman was saying, um, Janice was say, saying about the digital inclusion piece. I think something that's worth considering is that because of the lockdown, um, a lot of the voluntary groups and parish councils etc weren't able to do as much in the way of communication using non-digital media as we would have done otherwise. Um, for example, it wasn't, it wasn't feasible to do a leaflet drop without feeling you were actually endangering those doing the delivering or those actually receiving the leaflets. So in normal situations, there would have been more um, activity, I believe, certainly from parish councils, um, certainly from voluntary organisations to help to just try and reach um, a, um, a lot of the digitally excluded um, residents. Um, and that's why it was, it, was, it was so disappointing that the um, leaflet that was produced by the excellent leaflet that was produced by the council didn't get everywhere it should have done um, because um, how how do you reach um, those residents is so so key also there was um, feedback from residents and a lot of them fell into the digital inclusion part um, exclusion part of it so it's just not knowing um, who to contact um, countless questions about food boxes for example um, who do you contact to get your food box? Do I get my food box? Oh, I'm, am I due my food box? And just trying to, even, even if you could get at the internet, trying to get the answers for those people was tricky. But for those without internet or without the um, nous, if you like, or confidence with the internet to be able to be, be able to look for that, um, really, really tricky. Um, so I think the the point that Janice has made is absolutely pertinent and really should be part of. Um, a key part of thinking in terms of preparing for what we hope won't happen, which is a, which will be a second wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really good points. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I agree. And I wonder if this is worth us looking at things like um, how the CSC can help uh, with telephone inquiries and what's been going on there. Um, and I wonder if there are any local groups like Age Concern we might be able to ask for an opinion because they might potentially have a better sense. Um, let's discuss that under work planning. Are there any more questions or points? Uh, yes, Natalie wants to come back. You're muted. Every time. <laughs> um, it was just picking up the point you made about telephone calls. Um, in terms of the the local response centre specifically and, and uh, contact and identifying um, people that may, may be shielding or, or vulnerable. We, we phoned um, literally hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, we were able, they were able to use um, some kind of contact data that, that we had to do that. Now that was very specific around um, that issue. 
but it is something that if they you know, if if we're identifying kind of real real gaps in in the population in terms of more um, general information, but important information around around COVID, it is potentially something that we could we could consider going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would actually, I know we talk about under work planning. Could we um, make a recommendation to cabinet that they um, that they have this on their radar and that perhaps um, maybe it fits under the social policy portfolio just to consider ways of, of communicating with those residents and making sure we're doing all that we can for them. Because um, even in the absence of a, a second official lockdown, a lot of those residents are are potentially screening and vulnerable and, and actually still not not back to normal, not back to work. So still have that information cut off. Um, if anyone disagrees with that course of action, unmute yourselves and shout at me. Otherwise, I'll take that as agreed. That's agreed then. Any more points on the COVID item? Just shout in chat, otherwise we're going to move on. Looks like we're done. Where did I put my agenda? OK, uh, so uh, the next item is the scrutiny action plan, and I suppose this is my item, uh, so I'll talk through it. Um, so you will recall that in March, I think it was, as I find the right bit of paper, um, we held our workshop to sort of follow up on the training events that we'd done earlier in the year um, to say how are we responding to the sort of revised statutory guidance around how scrutiny is carried out um, and to sort of make the most of that training and our ambitions for what this committee wants to be. So I was really pleased to be able to, to pull this report together that I hope um, reflects those discussions that we had and some of those aspirations that we have for how we want to work this year um, and obviously this is this is published I'm going to take it as read and not not talk you whole through the whole thing the big caveat around all of this now of course is um, the event and and certainly the work plan suggestions that we had um, possibly are not as valuable to undertake um, while we're not doing business as usual um, and we can talk about that more under work planning. Um, but I suppose what I'd be interested to get from this discussion uh, is whether you're broadly happy with the sort of priorities and actions that I've listed based on our workshop discussion, whether you think there's anything you would like to add. Um, and then I'd just like to add my thanks for your engagement last year, for your engagement with the training and the workshop, um, and my hope that we will carry on uh, improving our scrutiny work and adding value uh, to the council's uh, policy making and performance monitoring process. So I don't know if anyone would like to speak on that. Uh, Lucy, I'll send you live. Thank you. I was I was just trying to work out which buttons to press on my, <laughs> on my device. I've got several screens in front of me. Um, I was just um, going to talk about um, the point 8A, where um, we, we're kind of trying to make a priority of the reports in a written format. Um, for me, that was actually one of the key things to come out of a lot of our workshops. It gives us time to actually fully read through everything and prepare our questions in advance of the meeting. So I think for me, that still has to be one of the priorities on there. And that, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, so obviously that was the first, that was A, the first one I picked up. I agree that's really important um, for us to do and we'll, we'll try to make sure that that happens a lot this year. Uh, Sarah, you'd like to come in. Hello, um, I, I really just wanted to say it was an excellent capture of everything that came out of it. I thought you captured it really well. And to echo what Lucy has just said, actually reports, I think we agreed with at least two weekends between the publish of the report and the uh, meeting at which we were going to discuss it. Uh, but otherwise, I thought it was an excellent report and I thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's really good to hear you felt it was good. So yes, you're right. We did discuss this idea of having two weekends. I didn't want to put it in as, a, as an action per se yet. I think it's an aspiration, but I think in the circumstances, of our staff being quite stretched by things at the moment, 
I want to do a little bit more work on how we make that practical and how we just fit that in with everyone's schedule so we're not we're not causing undue stress but absolutely if we can get those two weekends I think we can give members time to do some really thorough uh, reading and reflection on the, the reports that are coming to us because certainly I know that some weekends I don't have time to get to it um, and I'm lucky that don't tell the university but I can juggle my work around if I need to to make sure I can get through the reports but obviously some people don't have that luxury so uh, a good reminder on that thank you Sarah were there any other points on that otherwise I'm going to take that action as effectively noted and agreed and we will press on with those those priorities and actions no good thank you um so uh we've got two items around uh, the environment now now we had had a suggestion uh, during the run through that we would put the environment task and finish group item last because it's only for noting um but jason informs me he has a little bit of a response to that to update us so i'm going to keep them in the order that they are on the agenda um, and i'm mindful that actually rupert and jason are going to want to stay for both of those items anyway so i don't think it actually helps anyone to get away any sooner um, so number eight on the agenda is environment and transport task and finish group. Um, I'm going to take the report as read, but I would like to ask uh, Rupert, please, to um, just respond to those recommendations. I know Jason uh, said he had some slides about it, um, but I think since we have the portfolio holder here, it would be nice to just bring you into the discussion around them and sending you live. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, very much for um, being able to come back to you on this. Um, clearly, obviously, the recommendations uh, have been um, looked into, and obviously, clearly, we'd be very happy to take those on board. Uh, very much, we believe that um, scrutiny is very much a key part to uh, the climate environment emergency, or, or indeed any work, in fact, that actually the environment is doing. Um, clearly, clearly, climate change in the environment is very much higher up the agenda um, uh, in the country, I think, in the world, um, and certainly is in Eastleigh as well, given that we uh, obviously um, uh, unanimous, unanimously passed the climate environment emergency emergency uh, strategy. We've obviously, as you know, we're going to be talking about the action plan um, in the next item, um, but clearly, obviously, um, further to the scrutiny meeting, etc. Obviously, there were some recommendations and obviously, clearly, uh, we are mindful of those and obviously are quite happy to embrace those. And obviously, we do see that um, scrutiny is absolutely a key, key part of this process because we want to absolutely make sure that we've got the absolute best. Um, and clearly, we want as many members obviously to be involved uh, cross party, if you like, um, with the strategy and action plan, um, because actually, you know, it's great when you're actually looking at it. But I think actually you do need uh, people from outside in effect that that sort of working group and the board um, to be able to sort of make sure that we're sort of on track. And if there are any issues, etc. actually, um, clearly there will be things that we will want to be looking at probably in greater detail and obviously clearly that would be really great that we've got more eyes if you like and people looking at that as I say to make sure that we've got the absolute best for the people of Eastleigh so I'm very happy to see um, as I say Jason has got some slides um, but clearly obviously if you're happy to just take that report as read then that's absolutely fine um, if Jason wants to add something to that then, then then it's up to you chair if you want to bring him in um, but obviously as I say the recommendations um, we find are obviously very very useful and obviously anything future um, that the, that the uh, scrutiny panel wants to come up with um, for us to look at then obviously we'd be very happy to look at that as well thank you chair thank you very much Rupert um, I think you're absolutely right that scrutiny wants to play a part in getting that right and I think we're all mindful um, that actually certainly with the the climate change work that we don't have five years to fail and try again that we need to be really on top of getting it right the first time in a sort of agile way um, Jason, you switched your camera on, so I'm going to bring you in just to, to add to what we've been doing in response to those recommendations, if I could. And you're live. Oh, OK, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to say, obviously, the um, the working group, uh, the task and finish group looked across all four of the the um, Green Borough corporate objectives. Um, and I, I was just going to pick out a few things where there's been progress since since the work back in, in June and in August. And some of this will be picked up in the next session when we look at the action plan. But certainly around green infrastructure, um, there was this discussion around biodiversity action plan. Um, 
there's been a significant increase in um, resources around ecology um, reflecting on the, the importance of that. So um, whilst we're not quite at the position we'd hope to be, um, the council's responded to that. So that's that's been quite a big, big move forwards from um, at least up to three, three times more resource around ecology. Um, on waste, there was quite a number of recommendations. Um, we did, we sort of followed the recommendation about a new waste policy. There was a new waste policy adopted um, after this, this, it was raised by the task and finish group. Um, we did have the welcome packs go out um, in December. There was, a, there was a card and a virtual welcome pack that was launched. Um, and I suspect there'd be further developments on that over time. Um, and the food waste um, scheme was was relaunched. Um, looking at the waste data, uh, it's indicated there was, um, it looks like we've had around a 1% increase in recycling over the last um, 12 months compared to the previous 12 months. So it's been quite successful on that side. Um, across the Excellent Environment for All portfolio, there was, there was a number of recommendations around targets. Um, that's obviously been picked up through the new climate and environmental emergency strategy. So we, we do need, now have a zero carbon target and we have um, some progress on that. Um, and there was some kind of wider recommendations around um, roads around schools. Um, we had the first school um, road closure in Hampshire was in Eastleigh and there's there was a great deal of work to pull that together with partners. Um, there was some discussions around trees and obviously there was the commitment in February around 160,000 trees by 2030. Um, and there was also some points around wildflowers and there's been some progress on that um, with some further plans later <clears throat> this year. On the transport portfolio, um, the, a number of the things have moved forwards. The, the, some clearance work started on the Botley Bypass. That's, I understand, been a little bit held up with um, construction work kind of stopped in the last few months, but that's due to, to commence shortly. Um, we now have a borough-wide air quality strategy, which has been signed off and has, has been validated by DEFRA, which is really, really positive. Um, and one of the recommendations talked about um, picking up other other forms of air quality and and, and sizes as well. And, and the the new strategy and, and reports and um, decisions that were made towards the, the back end of last year included new monitoring equipment across four sites and starting for the first time to monitor um, PM 2.5, which is which is quite positive. So we've we've. We have moved um, on a number of the recommendations which were which were set out, and I, I just wanted to kind of um, update um, the the panel on on where we've picked up on on those recommendations and, and how they've how they've shaped our policies and our, our our decisions as they've moved forwards. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. It's it's lovely to be able to get an update. Um, um, on how our recommendations have had an effect. Um, I think uh, Jen wanted to come in uh, on this item. Thank you. Yeah, um, just wanted to um, add to what you're saying about the waste data and recycling data. It's quite interesting how many residents are complaining about um, not having the food waste bins anymore. <laughs> so being something which is pushed very hard for, it's sadly being retrieved. I'm getting asked a lot in terms of when are we get the food waste bins back? When are we get the food waste bins back? So um, it's great to see that um, that's moved from being something perhaps which is was seen as a little bit peripheral to being a lot more um, further forward in people's minds. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting paper to um, review, given um, some of the noise which is going around um, green recovery. Um, possibly there might be some more opportunities for helping residents, particularly around the energy efficiency of their homes. There could be some good opportunities coming through there. I think it's also um, possibly worth looking at as well from a point of view of what, what people have tried out during lockdown um, that maybe they haven't tried before. That massive growth, for example, in people growing their own veg. Um, appreciating their own gardens, appreciating their immediate neighbourhood. Um, I think that's something which could be um, Definitely an opportunity. Great, thank you. Um, Councillor Carl would like to respond, and then I've got a question uh, from Judith. 
uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and Jim's absolutely right. I mean, there are going to be, um, you know, out of this awful situation that we've we've all been experiencing, people have obviously have changed the way that they live. There's people, lots more people have been uh, cycling and walking, enjoying their gardens, being in their gardens, as you say, quite rightly, growing vegetables, flowers, all sorts of things. Um, people have found themselves with with quite a bit more time on their hands, etc., either through being furloughed or or, or for other reasons, etc., and uh, not being able to sort of, as it were, go out and, and do what they would normally do. Um, and and so therefore. Well, yes, I think there will be opportunities that we'll be able to, to, to work with and, and, and obviously clearly anything that comes forward will clearly want to be looked at um, uh, you know, seriously in effect really um, and, and to be able to seize those opportunities when they arise um, so that we don't actually just turn the page and go back to what we normally did um, and, and I think actually there, there's a real appetite out there and I think Jin is absolutely absolutely right there. There is an appetite out there for people who genuinely have just sort of looked at things differently shall we say they've they've reordered their priorities to a degree about what actually really matters and actually the environment and their surroundings etc you know people just walking around looking at the environment going to a local park all those sorts of things when they were able to do so um people seem to have sort of really embraced that and certainly feel that it's actually far more important than maybe possibly it might have been in the past so i do think there are opportunities and, and, and i would i would hope uh, and i certainly will push as well and i'm sure i think the officers would probably be exactly the same that if i if there are things that we can we can embrace and we can encourage residents and, and help etc for them to do and achieve then clearly obviously the council has its part to play and obviously I'll be very happy to, to to want to make sure that we are able to do that as well with regards to the food waste collection obviously yes I'm afraid that was paused that's the only service in effect really that uh, that has been paused as you as you're all very well aware living in Eastleigh uh, your um, your waste is obviously being collected on a, on a regular basis um, uh, and as I say food waste was the only one that was paused there were issues originally around um, potential um, concerns about collecting wet waste albeit that obviously uh, th that in effect is is uh, not quite so much the case now the issue is really all about social distancing um, with regards to the crews um, obviously uh, having those amount of people in the cabs etc makes it incredibly difficult so obviously they've actually had uh, other members of the crews following in other vehicles so obviously ha having to do that extra task of collecting food waste um, obviously is is a lot more problematic for them um, yes obviously that is under review on a constant basis and clearly obviously we will want to continue and, and restart that um, uh, collection of food waste as soon as practically uh, is possible to do so so yes it is being actively looked at and obviously it was a shame we had to pause it but we did it for all the right reasons and that actually was uh, obviously clearly the health and safety of our staff which obviously has to remain um, paramount thank you chair Thank you, Rupert. Yes, I have to agree with those comments around around food waste, and it's nice to hear that it's coming back. I must say, I keep having little bits of food I want to get rid of, and I feel a bit sad as I go past the food waste bin and put them in the in the general waste or throw them out the window into the garden, uh, if appropriate. Um, Judith, I think you wanted to come in with a question. You're muted. Yes, it was a bit sensitive and it went off again. Um, yes, two questions for Jason Light, actually. Uh, he said that there's been a significant inc increase uh, in resources um, around ecology. Could could you put could you quantify that, please, in, 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 in pounds? Um, my second question um, is about the one percent increase in recycling. Uh, rates in the last 12 months. Well, that's great because we need to get recycling up, not just in Eastleigh, but across Hampshire. Um, but uh, a 1% increase, does that take us back to what our peak was? Because my understanding is that in Eastleigh, recycling rates had fallen quite a lot, which is why you had the big push last year. So how, how far below are, are we from what our maximum recycling waste was. Um, in terms of the measuring PM 2.5, is that being done across all of the AQMAs? And those are my three questions, thank you. Thank you, Judith. And I will ask Jason to respond to those, please. Okay. Um, on the, the air quality question, um, I haven't got that in front of me actually as to whether they're on all of the sensors. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to kind of um, say something I'm not quite sure on, but we can certainly get back to you and let you know. Um, I th if it should be in the cabinet report that went through at the end of the year. I think it says what sensors were on what, but I, I couldn't tell you right now, but I'll, Thank you. I'll follow that up. Um, 
regarding the the kind of recycling rates um certainly the the level we're at what well, it's sort of early early data it needs to be kind of verified but the the level we're at at the moment is is higher than it's been for the last five years from the the data that i'm looking across um but Do you have it, any numbers for that it's uh not in front of me i was just trying to quickly look it up because I've, i was looking at the spreadsheet earlier earlier today um uh it's certainly i mean it's it it can fluctuate based on various different things last year mm. dropped a bit because it was um a particularly bad summer for for gardening so the the garden waste dropped quite considerably um the other kind of challenge we've had historically where we've we've dipped is is been more around composition of waste and changes in the type of waste that's thrown away by by residents and um that we've 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 obviously we've we've introduced services and we've introduced glass and we've done things but the other than the food and the glass there hasn't been any change to the service we've we've provided whereas the composition's changed um which is which has been involved in in that kind of drift but certainly um we are kind of seeing seeing some improvements across the board um which is which is really positive um i've just got the sheet open actually so i can have a look um once it loads up properly um so the annual recycling certainly in the last few years it's it's kind of gone it's been fairly stable around um the the sort of 42 mark for the last three four years um and this year it's 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 jumped it was it was around 43.4 so it's jumped up over just over a percentage point which which is quite positive without any other infrastructure changes that's just us doing promotion and 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 um relaunching that food waste scheme so that's that's quite positive my understanding was, and I, I, I can't quote the paper, was that it was uh, approaching 50% at one point in the past. Um, it may well have been. I'd say I, I don't, I haven't got data that goes all the way back, but it's, it's. Um, it would be good to get those at some point, please. Mm, OK, yeah, we can look at that. And, and, and the spend uh, increase in resources, you said uh, it's gone up three times the resource. The, well, I've, I've more. Yeah, I was more talking about the kind of FTE people. Um, so we historically we've had we've had one ecologist for a while. Um, we've now um, recruited for uh, three other people in that team, which which equates to um, just over three FTE. So um, there's there's a couple of senior roles and, and a, a junior role and all in all in that structure. So it's 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 quite a significant increase where we've we've kind of recognised there's 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 quite a big need there and it's there's quite a big program that that's being taken forward so that's that's been a a um quite recent development in that area okay thank you thank you jason um and i think rupert just wanted to add something to that uh thank you jay only just very quickly really to be honest with you actually it was just very in, in, interesting i've spoken to paul naylor obviously as you're probably very well aware keeping up to date with what's going on during this 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 emergency um and and just to say that actually we've had uh, the amount of people that have actually been signing up for our green garden waste collection services actually uh, uh increased um uh, significantly um clearly obviously as the hwrc's were obviously closed due to the, the pandemic um so it's really encouraging actually to see that residents were responding and changing their sort of habits if you like um by actually um, uh, joining our green garden waste collection, which obviously brings um, very welcome revenue to the council. Um, with regards to obviously historic rates of recycling, obviously as clearly um, uh, Councillor Greski is probably very well aware, um, you know, things may very may, may very well have changed as to what you can put in your recycle bin over that period of time. So it would actually be really interesting to understand, uh, to track that, um, because clearly obviously there are different things that we are able to put into the bin or we're being told by Hampshire County Council or Veolia that we are able to recycle and I continually raise these issues at PI, Project Integra, um, but also with the County Council through the Economy, Transport and Environment Select Committee, where clearly there are items, unfortunately, in our residual waste, which clearly should actually not be there, um, in my view, um, and should actually be uh, more widely recycled, as indeed they are in other County Councils um, uh, around the country. So where we were 
actually an industry leader with regards to uh, our recycling rate. Uh, we were in the top quartile, I think, of the count of the recycle um, tables, shall we say, in the country. We are now, unfortunately, um, probably um, a lot lower down that table, I'm afraid, albeit that we still are um, either probably now the best recycling um, authority, district authority in the uh, in Hampshire, um, if not um, very, very closely behind uh, at number two. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, the, the RAP um, uh, initiative in effect, which was relaunching the food waste um, collection, clearly we had seen food waste sort of reduce over a period of time. And that just really uh, was down to sort of comms and keeping on top of that sort of thing. Once we relaunched that with the obviously very welcome grant that we received from RAP, um, uh, we obviously did see quite a significant increase in effect in tonnage of um, uh, food waste um, collected, which clearly obviously was uh, coming out of the black bin. Obviously, clearly, I have to put the caveat that clearly we don't want people to be wasting food in the first place. Um, uh, so reducing food is clearly obviously the priority, but obviously clearly where people can't um, should we say compost at home, then clearly um, obviously being able to collect that separately and be able to send that off to create green uh, electricity obviously clearly is, 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 is a positive thing to do. So I just wanted to put a little bit of, uh, shall we say, narrative around that. It's all very well looking at the, the raw data, but we also might want to look at actually what was accepted in our green bins at that time, because um, they clearly might show that actually there's less and less being able to be accepted by Veolia and the County Council, not more, which is obviously what we've been pushing for um, continually um, from our side to the county and Veolia through PI. Yes, Thanks, and if I can just add some clarity to that. I mean, it is good that Eastleigh recycles more than some of the other districts which have to catch up, but I'm sure that Councillor Curl as a county councillor will appreciate that Hampshire County Council is an ethical recycler and we will not collect things uh, that can't be recycled properly and we because we, we do not ship things out to the Far East. Thank you for that addition and thank you, Rupert. Uh, uh, for those points and um, I think oh I think Jen wanted to add something yes please um I've seen some reports expressing concern that um corporate um reporting of carbon may be under reporting as a result of the coronavirus because it won't necessarily be reflecting the full energy use of um operations due to due to um colleagues work from work due, due to employees working from home um, and that's something that might want to be considered in terms of how the carbon figures are reflected for um, the borough council um, going forward. That's quite a complex one, but um, I know that you're recruiting at the moment um, for a climate change expert. So perhaps that's something that would be useful to pass over to whoever ends up getting employed for that. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was um, the airport. Um, it doesn't appear in this report, and I'm sure that um, we had when we were talking about um, the action plan initially, um, Rupert, myself and um, Margaret, we, 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 we were very keen that the impact of the airport should be um, included within the action plan because it seemed crazy not to be um, taking into account its impact. Um, so I think that's something I'd like to see revisited. Um, and thirdly, um, really pleased that um, lots of activities were done to try and engage local people, um, meetings, etc. The Climate Champions Initiative. One of the criticisms that I heard was people didn't necessarily know about them, um, in particular councillors. Um, so when they do get restarted, hopefully at the end of um, when, when we're able to do so safely, can we please make sure that we do everything we can to engage councillors as well as parish councils and other voluntary organisations in those initiatives. Um, there seems to be an awful lot of, that's a fantastic idea, why didn't, why didn't I know about it? So um, try, let's try and maximise on that goodwill as much as we can. Thank you, Jin. Um, we have entirely reasonably uh, sort of segued into the uh, Climate and Environmental Emergency Strategy and Action Plan update. Rupert just wanted to respond to Judith, we're then going to draw a line under that which is still formally uh, the task and finish report. Unless anyone shouts at me, we'll take that as noted um, and then we will have a presentation on the action plan and then segue back into Jin's questions. If that sounds OK to everyone, so Rupert, Sorry, I was out of order there. <laughs> <laughs> entirely reasonable. It's just we have to follow the agenda, don't we? Um, Rupert, I'll bring you back briefly for a response to Judith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 
I won't um, take up too much of your time. Um, clearly, um, we've got a lot to talk about probably in the next item, but just wanted to come back on that point about ethical recycling. Uh, I, I didn't want to leave it there, really, to be honest. I think that's slightly unfair, really, to be fair. But um, you know, clearly, I want to see ethical recycling. I don't want things sent off to the Far East. As we've seen these these programs where there are just bailed plastic bags and all this sort of stuff in in Malaysia and other countries and everything else. Uh, I would never advocate that. I don't want I, I don't want that. But there clearly are items. I'm afraid that is in the residual waste actually that other authorities do um, recycle that we don't. Veolia don't see that there is a market and a profit and that is the reason that that's what drives them and that's what they they say are the, why the reasons are that certain items can go into the green bin and can't. Um, glass is a typical example of that. Um, you know the glass market fluctuates widely um, and actually you know if you were to actually look at a business case for glass collection you'd probably actually say well it doesn't really stack up there's not a huge amount of money you get for tonnage of glass but clearly it's something that we don't want to see that's just basically thrown away it ought to be recycled it ought to have a recyclable life um, and therefore that's the reason why we collect it and so many other authorities do um, when the government waste resources strategy um, comes or the environment bill sorry comes out um, it is very likely that every authority will have to collect food waste separately um, and that obviously clearly is a good thing and it's just really great that Eastleigh took that initiative many years ago albeit that the county council didn't support it now now, clearly when they're looking at their budgets with regards to the cost of waste uh, getting rid of waste which is obviously a huge amount of money out of their budget they're clearly now looking at all sorts of different things about how waste can be collected and disposed of because clearly it's obviously incredibly expensive and obviously those things they're now looking at places like Eastley who have managed to lead the way with recycling and continue to do so um, and actually waste um, and alternate weekly collections are those options that they are sort of looking at um, amongst other things as well um, but at the end of the day um, you know I just wanted to come back on the ethical recycling I didn't want to leave it there because clearly I would not advocate non-ethical recycling um, but clearly there are items that do go to energy recovery which could be used in other ways um, there are even there are some authorities I believe that are using non-recyclable plastic in um, highway aggregate to make sure that tarmac in effect which is obviously incredibly carbon intense intensive um, means it can actually go further so um, you know there are things that Hampshire could do and we do keep pushing for that sort of stuff um, and I'm sure as I say don't get me wrong uh, Councillor Humby and Councillor Jarvis etc obviously are working incredibly hard so I'm not trying to make a cheap shot at them but I just didn't want to leave it with the fact that ethical recycling is not something that we would want to support in Eastleigh. Clearly, we do want to support that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rupert. So um, the, the borough's recycling um, and general waste uh, handling is, of course, um, being uh, considered through a project that will, uh, in due course, come to scrutiny. Um, and I'm sure uh, Rupert and Judith can continue this debate uh, at the County Council as well. Uh, like I said, for now, I'm going to draw a line under item eight, which is the report of the Environment and Tran Transport Task and Finish Group. Uh, unless anyone shouts at me, I'm going to take that as read and ag agreed to the extent that it needs to be, which is not much, um, and move on to uh, item nine formally, which is the Climate Change and Environmental Emergency Strategy and Action Plan update. There's a mouthful. Um, and Jason, were you going to present that report, please? You're muted. Yes, I, I was going to. Is it OK to do a screen share? Yes, please. Is that showing? Ah. It is and it is live. OK, excellent. Um, I, I've taken note of a couple of the questions that have come up and I'll, I'll try and pick them out throughout, but obviously we can we can come back for some questions. Um, um, I won't go into too much detail because we've, we've had quite a few sessions with, with this panel. Um, so obviously we, we have the task and finish group, which is fed into this. There was the the training sessions that kind of led up to a joint motion at full council and then eventually culminating in the in the the strategy in the, in the interim action plan, which was agreed at full council in, in November. Um, um, we What we've put forward isn't an update to the strategy itself. That was um, uh, quite a, a, a hopefully strong set of principles which we should be able to follow for the next next decade. But the um, the action plan is is a kind of ongoing evolving piece. And so this is a, a this is the report is, a, is an update on that and also 
um, is an update on the council's um, annual carbon and greenhouse gas report, which is um, so it, it picks up some of the aspects, but not all of the aspects that um, Councillor Tidridge mentioned. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. Um, one of the kind of key things which came out of um, the um, the cross party working group when we developed the strategy was about um, ensuring that we were covering properly covering what the emissions were for the council um, and that that's kind of uh, linked to what um, Councillor Tidris was talking about but our, our original measure which is based on the, the DEFRA methodology um, followed um, the kind of what they call scopes one to three um, and but it didn't include everything which relates to our emissions so um, gas oil fuel electricity water um, a, a small element of business travel um, were included but there was a wider wider pocket and the agreement um, back in November was that our we would look to include a much broader range of things and I'll, I'll, I'll show that in a moment um, I just thought it'd be worth kind of showing the the intention is we will continue to show the old methodology as well as our our own bespoke methodology um for one point because it, it's 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 helpful to see that you can go all the way back to 2007 but also um that's the general approach used by other local authorities so we can kind of benchmark it a little to that um but there's there's been some progress on, on that sense um one thing you can kind of see in these numbers the the scope one is is increased that's predominantly around um, the an increase in gas consumption for CHP system, which has been fixed and, and improved at um, the um, places leisure easily. Um, so that's increased the gas consumption, but it's also meant that we've been producing more um, electricity for um, places leisure. At the moment, we are accounting for that in our electricity figures, but we're, we're looking at um, apportioning that a bit better and there's some extra metering we need to put in place for some things so um, they're, they're actually probably slightly inflated those figures based on that um, if I go to the the new measure um, you'll see this includes a much wider kind of pocket of information so on scope two we've, we've now included biomass um, and there's a, there's a limited amount of biomass um, in, in our countryside sites um, on scope three, the, perhaps the most significant, we've now um, taken account of um, commuting to work, which is which is um, better practice. Um, and we also have um, an assessment of procurement based on annual spend. Um, I think this this is the one area that's that's really quite significant. It, it probably triples, if not quadruples, probably further. Our, council's emissions but it's taking into account a, a much broader more holistic view on that and that was and that was the approach that we agreed um what was quite interesting and one of the reasons i haven't put percentages on here is that the the analysis we've done on procurement of last year seemed to show quite a, a drop in annual emissions um and i'm not entirely comfortable that 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 might be right because uh, it's it's I think a fairly kind of um, a rough estimate. So I've I've spoken to some consultants who specialise in this area, and, and it's slightly we're going to look to improve that over time because it's it's showing a really big reduction in in our emissions. But you know one of our core principles is being quite transparent on this. So we just need to verify that and get some external verification because you know I'm, our spend was was pretty similar between the last two years so we need to look at that um there was one area that was quite significant which was around construction and 1819 had a had a, a much bigger spend on construction than 1920 and there's a there's a big carbon apportionment to that so it is possible that it's roughly right but i i just i didn't want to put a percentage in the report alludes to that um the thing that's not included in this, which, which um, Councillor Tidridge mentioned, was around um, people working at home and how we might apportion for that. That is certainly something that's picked up in the sector and um, we've been kind of looking at that. Obviously, if people are working at home um, and they live in the borough, then they would be picked up by the, the 2030 
um, ambition for for net zero that we're we're starting to kind of gather the data on that. Um, so you you could argue it would be picked up by that, but it's it's we're we're having some discussions and looking at what, how we might try and apportion it as part of our our kind of ongoing review of this. Um, as kind of mentioned, the the airport is picked up on our 2030 figures, but the figures in this report and and the appendix that goes into a bit more detail. Um, is only based on council emissions. It's not based on the 2030 borough wide target. So the airport's not not covered in these, but it is it will continue to be picked up on the other in the other figures. Um, as mentioned, the, the new measure I've, I've mentioned biomass and I've mentioned travel to work um, and I've mentioned procurement. The, the other three areas which are kind of um, dashed out at the moment, but they are included within the scope and we're just we're working on methodology and how we might measure some of these uh, around other greenhouse gases which um, have an impact on on the climate which we're looking at how we how we kind of main, sort of measure that over time um, so that's from um, air conditioning units if if there's unfortunately any kind of leakage or anything we want to apportion that we've got no evidence there is but it's it's um, prudent to include all of these things um, and council land use so there's there's there is already significant um, carbon sequestration based on council land use. We we haven't um, used the methodology yet, and, uh, and through discussions with the ecologists and the countryside manager, we, we're talking about how we can use some some national methodology to account for some of the positive things that we already do as a council through managing our land. Um, and then um, offsets and credits. We we haven't purchased anything specifically, but that is something that we might purchase or we might set up a scheme that's that's something we're developing but that that's part of the balance sheet um just to run through a couple of things i won't go into too much detail of this because it's it's in the report but um we've mentioned around additional ecological and, and also environmental health um team we've we've, we've had some re recent recruitment on that side dealing with other environmental issues um there's the two posts which were announced in February at full council. Um, the climate change manager post is currently out for advert um, and we've had a significant level of interest. I, I had an email during this meeting from someone interested in the role. Um, so it's it's there's hopefully we'll have some really good success bringing some brilliant into the team to to um, take up the, the baton and drive this forward. Um, the green energy post um, we were pretty much on the cusp of advertising for that but the that role um, sits with our facilities manager who is incredibly busy um, dealing with the health crisis at the moment so um, we've, we've we're as soon as there's capacity to to go out to recruitment that, that will move forward but that's again another kind of critical role that we've been um, still continuing to make um, improvements and move things forwards but that role will hopefully happen soon um, We've spoken about air quality already today. Um, the, there's some work going on at the moment to um, agree the scope for a pollution strategy, which will pick up um, not just air quality for humans, but air quality and the impacts on ecological receptors, and then move into the wider range of pollution, um, noise, dust, light pollution, um, and pick up some of the cross-cutting things around things like tranquility and, and matters like that. So we're, we're, we're just working that through and that, that at some point will, I suspect, need to come back to the scrutiny um, for policy and performance to, to look at that strategy later in the year. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've now got um, some electric vehicles within our fleet and we're, we're starting to roll out um, further improvements. Um, we've also... Um, uh, we have some electric charging points at Eastley House and we, we've made some progress um, around um, electric charging points for the public, which should hopefully um, go to decision soon where we've, we've identified some locations. Um, I've mentioned around ecology, so there's there's some work there um, and I think there's, there's um, an item possibly in future around the, the tree policy and the approach there. Um, on training, we we have a um, a program of training that we, we we put together, and we were looking to kind of uh, launch before um, 
the the health crisis took hold um so we're, we're kind of looking to work that up and look at how we can do that electronically and, and change that but one of the things that was that was quite unique was we've um we're looking at working with the or we've agreed to work with the institute of environmental management and assessment and be the first local authority to kind of partner with them to to run training courses which are accredited training courses um so we're not just doing um internal things we're doing something which is um quite leading edge and, and will really upskill our staff professionally as well as knowledge um so that's that's moving forward um we now have a, a new procurement officer um and um she's started to kind of look at the policies and guidance and training um and work that through there's been discussions at the procurement executive group around that there's there's some work going on there um housing is is one of the sort of key areas that we've picked up and there's been some discussions around how we embed this in in our our, our housing program both delivered by the council and beyond um and then obviously um issues around nutrient budgeting and the impact that that has on um we have on the ecology and then obviously the knock-on effect that that might have on on things like the housing program um there's there's a strand there where we we there was a recent cabinet report and there's there's kind of ongoing developments there um and that was what i wanted to kind of run through brilliant thank you jason um so because this is a fairly substantial item i am told i'm sure reliably that i should get a proposer and a seconder for it because some people shout in chat if they'd like to propose and second this item Can be literally anybody. There we go. Um, I've got uh, Sarah to propose, uh, Alan to second, um, and I'd like to ask Jin if you could come back. Um, I know Jason tried to speak to some of your points. Um, could you reiterate any that are outstanding? I'm then going to go to uh, Dave, um, and then anyone else who wants to speak. So, uh, Jin. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Jason. That was a great summary. Um, so you've addressed the working from home. You've mentioned that the airport um, is something which we still need to try and work out how to get into the numbers, um, but that'll be for the borough rather than just for the council. But obviously we need to work out how to do that. Um, my final point was about um, when we start, when we're in a position to start getting the engagement um, sessions going again whether virtue or actually just making sure that um, members know about them, making sure that parish councils know about them um, and just doing what we can just to try and spread the word a little bit. Um, I think there were some, some quite green minded councillors who were disappointed that the first they knew of these sessions was um, being told by somebody else um, that they seen, seen information about it as opposed to being fe fe feeling that they'd had a, um, a heads up. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Um, Jason, do you want to come back on those outstanding points and then we'll go to Rupert? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, apologies, Jen. I, I meant to cover that. I wrote that down on my list. Um, and obviously the um, the programme that we launched, we had a launch event in February, um, which was which was quite successful. There was there was a, a really good um, range of residents and involved in that session and we were we were due to launch um we had a training course booked in in march which um there was an invitation that went out to um i think it was all of the um parish clerks the um chairs and vice chairs of all of the parish councils um inviting them to that session um plus um some additional councillors in in uh, eastley town centre because obviously that's the the kind of non-parish area so we we did some some engagement on that sense and, and also um, there was some the, the sort of external marketing and I, I think something might have gone in the, the the member bulletin but it's it's certainly we're, we're quite mindful that it's um, any any kind of engagement we can do to encourage people to come along to those sessions it's 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 if we think we've we've got enough plan we probably need to double it um, to, to try and reach everyone as much as possible um, the program at the moment we're just trying to work through um whether we need to kind of 
launch something as a virtual um, session or if it's something that needs to be kind of held back the the, the complexities around um, making sure we maintain momentum but also um, it's, it's given the, the significance of the health crisis we, we don't um, we're, we're trying to avoid kind of putting messages out which would either confuse the existing um, messaging or um, even if they don't they, they might not land with people because they're, they're, they're busy worried about other things at the moment quite understandably so um, but certainly we, we take your point on board the, about um, being uh, expanding our engagement with certainly with members but also with the public because we we are you know quite key in our strategy that we are there as a kind of facilitator and we we need to engage with as many people and community groups and and businesses as possible <laughs> across the borough and find every way possible to, to look at that so yeah definitely worth exploring um on the airport obviously our, our original strategy and report that went through in november did include an assessment of the airport and we we had a uh, consultant look at that because we were we were mindful that that was not included in the government data um alongside a number of lifestyle matters which aren't included in the in the usual kind of government methodology for borough-wide reporting so um we we did include that then the there isn't an intention not to include it in future it's just we haven't produced a, a report looking at um the emissions from for the borough and, and heading towards that target yet we've been we've been focused on the the um the report we need to we need to do by the end of july for for base on the council's emissions but it's it's certainly something that, that hasn't dropped off it, it will be considered Thank you, Jason. I'm going to go straight to Rupert, who I think wanted to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to come back, really. Um, uh, I was going to say a few words at the beginning of the report, but obviously you went straight to Jason, which is absolutely fine, Chair. It's no problem at all. Um, but just uh, just wanted to commend this report and the work that obviously has been undertaken so far on this. Clearly, uh, we were um, tasked with coming back to the um, <coughs> policy and performance scrutiny panel uh, with a more detailed action plan, which I, I think we've achieved that. Clearly, obviously, we've had the, the COVID-19 emergency uh, um, uh, situation uh, intervening in that time and obviously that means we weren't able to come back to you in March with that de more detailed plan. Um, clearly obviously as you can see uh, the action log has obviously been populated with quite a lot of information and a huge amount of work has been put in by officers across the whole council because clearly as you will see from the report um, clearly it touches it, every department and, and, and every officer and in, in, indeed in, in the work that they do on a daily basis and clearly we wanted to make sure we are able to capture all of that so we can understand where we are, um, the journey that we're on and where we want to uh, uh, go to actually achieve our carbon neutrality by 2025. Um, obviously the borough work as Jason has alluded to is obviously um, working in, in line with this but obviously clearly is, a, is another element which obviously clearly has different strands that we want to bring in including the airport and as Jim will probably be aware the airport actually has its own um, strategy strategy of carbon neutrality, which they're obviously wanting to achieve. Um, and uh, I actually attended the uh, um, gr um, the um, ground electrical charging um, launch, which they did at the airport. Obviously, this was prior to COVID-19, which obviously then saw the carbon um, neutral ceasing apart from of the flights, I believe. Sorry, carbon neutral apart from the flights. <laughs> Well, yes, no, I know, but at the end of the day, it still is a plan that they are very much engaged with. Um, and clearly, obviously, that's quite positive. All I was going to say with that was that clearly where we are able to work with them on their plan, and, and, and obviously they were very keen with what uh, to see what we were doing as well, then obviously clearly that's got to be a positive thing as well to work with those and other partners as well to be able to um, to to uh, move this narrative forward. So, yeah, you're quite right about the flights, um, but clearly everyone's got to start from somewhere. And we, we clearly knew when we had the working group that the airport needed to be in, included in all of our figures and, and wanting to work forward. And we're very um, blessed that we do have a regional airport within our borough or on the borough boundary. Um, but clearly, obviously, that does have a significant impact, obviously, on our on our carbon um on the carbon footprint if you like of the, of the borough so um yeah so all i was trying to allude to is the fact that they do have aspirations themselves to want to tackle some of the issues that they know uh that they have an effect on um but i just wanted to commend this report there's a lot of work that's been gone into it it's clearly the start of the journey um and uh but i think it's a positive start 
Um, and uh, as I say, I just wanted to thank Jason, obviously Sarah, the other members of the board and members as well and officers clearly who've obviously um, had to think differently um, and come up and come forward with ideas, etc. of how they would be able to address uh, these kinds of issues in, the, in their departments and in the work that they produce on behalf of all of us. So uh, my big thanks to them. But as I say, this is the start of the journey. And as I'd already said before, Chair, um, clearly PNP um, is a, a very key part of this. And obviously we will very much welcome any questions um, and obviously it's ongoing scrutiny as we move forward and move through this process. So thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Rupert. I can go straight to Judith if I wanted to think wanted to come in with some questions. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Tempting though it is to uh, comment on the importance of regional airports and uh, and, and the Solent economy, I'll, I'll stick to my two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, the Climate Change Board. How frequently is that meeting? When did it last meet? And would it be possible to put the, the minutes of those meetings, however, however brief, in the public domain? That's my first question. Because uh, obviously there's a lot of public interest in this and I, I'm sure that there aren't any secrets. Um, and uh, secondly, um, going to Appendix A and um, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through it point by point. Um, however, at number one, it talks about ecology, carbon, carbon sequestration schemes, uh, develop proposals for large scale habitat and secure funding. Um, uh, you know, that's how, how much and, and when and where from um, at point um, 30, uh, no, Appendix A, point eight, it talks about something happening uh, when it's uh, an ap appropriate time. Um, the point at number 30, the grey water scheme, sounds really interesting. Um, again, it also sounds expensive. So when can we expect to see a fully costed programme um, and, and, and how much money is going to be allocated in, in, in the budget? Thank you, Judith. Um, so there were some questions there around the board that feel like questions for uh, Rupert who is on that board. So Rupert, if you could respond to that and then there were some more technical questions that are probably better uh, answered by Jason unless unless Rupert also wants to answer those. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> with regards to the board, um, that's a very good question, Judith. I might have to get back to you on that. Um, thank I'm you. Sure we, I'm, we did have a meeting virtually. Yep. I'm, I'm sure we had a meeting virtually. I have to say, I'm probably like yourself, uh, there's been a, a significant amount of um, uh, virtual meetings and Zooming and everything going on at the moment, but um, I'm sure we had one pretty recently, to be honest, because we were I actually- I still know what day it is. <laughs> yes, I will. I will, we we will. Uh, Jason might be able to answer. I'd have to look through my diary. Um, but yes, it was it was relatively recently that we had a, a board meeting because obviously clearly we were discussing uh, the timeline of obviously bringing this to policy and performance, um, and obviously looking through the action plan and action log. So we have had a virtual meeting uh, relatively recently in the last um, uh, last month or so, I believe. Um, but clearly, I will give you a date. Um, it will be so good I to see the de those dates because you know you've put some dates as targets for when things going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. unless you map that out with meetings and things, yeah. sorry, I know I'm teaching grandma to suck no, eggs no. here, but I think it's no, no. important. No, you're absolutely right, um, councillor. It is very important and I can assure you that clearly where there are time um, uh, limits or, or targets, shall we say, uh, within the action plan. Obviously, the board and the officers uh, uh, will be obviously monitoring to make sure that we are meeting those targets or indeed if there were any issues why they would not be achieved, then clearly obviously that will be monitored to make sure to understand before we got to that point, what was the reason? Why was there? Is there an intervention? You know, is it is it down to capacity or whatever to be able to make sure that that comes to fruition? With regards to um, uh, budgets, etc., um, clearly there was an under uh, there was an understanding, and I think Jim will will will, will bear me out on this. Um, that clearly some of these are sort of short term, medium term and long term aspirations. Um, clearly within that, there will be things that the council will be able to, um, uh, shall we say, uh, <coughs> um, deliver through its its already original capacity, its existing capacity. Um, there will obviously be other things which are uh, a bit more aspirational, shall we say, and clearly business cases will need to be formulated and brought forward and assessed. 
Um, obviously, that'll be a cost benefit analysis, etc., about what the impacts of those sorts of things or what that intervention will bring to the borough, obviously to the benefits of the environment, etc., or whatever, or, or our carbon footprint or, or reporting figures. Um, and then obviously, once that's been assessed, obviously, we will then bring that forward um, for, or for funding within a budget um, process. Um, clearly, there'll be external funding and grants that will be available as well. And obviously, clearly, we, 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 we can't have a crystal ball to understand exactly what either government or other agencies, environment agencies, Southern Water, other private business or whatever will bring forward. And we have worked with some private partners, as you're probably aware, in the past with initiatives, with water butts and all those sorts of things. Um, and, and so therefore those opportunities will come forward. Obviously, it, we won't know when they will come forward, but clearly when they do, like, like we had the grant from RAP, which obviously was very beneficial to be able to relaunch our, relaunch our food waste. Clearly, once those come forward, if we have an action plan where we're able to say, do you know, we can actually, you know, we can deliver this. This is our aspiration. Here is our action log or, or whatever. Then clearly that will probably attract funding as well. We may be able to deliver some of those aspirations as well. So um, it is a living document. It is going to be going on all the way through to 2025. And I'm hoping it will be taken a lot further forward as well with things being delivered, new things going on, uh, onto the list, etc. As I say, the small, uh, sorry, the short, the medium and the long term as well. Clearly funding will be an issue and this was identified when we had the working group and clearly through the board as well. Um, we don't have all the answers about how much things will cost and yes, some things will be expensive. Some things may be not quite as expensive as we thought, but clearly we want to then be able to prioritise all of this stuff and this is where PMP are obviously quite key as well to be able to make sure that we're on track to be able to deliver those things which we all signed up for when we um, when we voted for this environment and climate change emergency um, because it's really really important that we get this right and we do it properly um, but clearly as I say there will be funding coming from elsewhere I'm, I, I'm, I'm confident I really hope there will be um, and clearly we aren't going to be able to afford to do all of this on our own um, but at the end of the day I think that uh, we, we've shown in EC that we are very good at collaborative working with other agencies and the county council bear in mind as well and of and other partners um, we, we're all in on board with this as well the county council have got their 2050 strategy as you well know which has got a lot of environment stuff in it very very pleasing to see um, and clearly we, we have meeting we have had meetings with officers at the county as well um, to discuss this and obviously where we are able to work together and with other district authorities as well and the private sector clearly we will want to do that to maximize what we are able to to offer and be able to deliver through our action log so so rest assured we are sharp and you know Jason is very sharp on this stuff yeah. if there's a whiff of any money anywhere I can assure you we will be applying for it and, and hopefully we'll be successful in, in achieving some thank you Chair. Well, can I just say I, I hope you're right about the funding um, uh, and that your confidence is uh, is well placed um, I look forward to seeing the the business cases um, I'm glad you mentioned the County Council because as you know the County Council allocated a specific sum in its budget uh, for climate change and to develop a climate change strategy and and at the county again be with your involvement with ETE uh, you'll know that we want to work very closely with the districts and boroughs so we work together on this so thank you Great, thank you. Um, I think there were some technical points, and I just wonder if Jason could come back on those. Oh, that's not that's not Jason. <laughs> that is Jason. Oh, it was thank you, Chair. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think Sarah's picked up the the date of the the last um, climate meeting, so the the twenty ninth of May. Um, was was the last meeting, so it was only only a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think certainly on on point eight, where it's talking about appropriate time. Obviously, we want to be quite smart with with setting targets and dates and things. Um, the I think sort of alluded to earlier, actually, with Councillor Greski, we were talking about um, the COVID nineteen and and the challenges around things are quite fluid, and and our sustainable travel manager is significantly involved in our in our approach and we've seen that with the pedestrianisation of, of the streets in Eastleigh and, and some of the other activities around sustainable transport so that's that's particularly why that one that one's um, a bit loose on the date that's that's kind of set out um, but it is something that we are talking about and um, more specifically on on the um, response to the the health crisis we you know we are um, the actual um, group which is overseeing the council's 
um, response and, and reset program includes representation on climate environmental emergency. So we very specifically one of the work programs um, directly links to this. So and that's that's where the um, we're ensuring that we are picking up these these issues. And, you know, if there are um, potentially positive things we can do as, as a response and, and to you know, the discussion on the earlier item, um, but also making sure that where there are kind of knock on effects or we're focusing on different things, that's that's picked up um, as well. So that's that's part of that. Um, I just check the uh, on the um, uh, ecology side of things um, from from the first first item. It's it's as I mentioned earlier, we've we've just we've recognised that there was there was a need to increase capacity to be able to pick up um, the various different things picked up around ecology. It was obviously our strategy for Eastley was was fairly unique in that it, it picked up the environment as well as climate and and showed linkages between the two of those. So, um, you know, I've, I know some councils have, have more recently declared ecological emergencies. Um, that was very intentionally across all, all members in July. We very intentionally included it within our, our approach. So um, in responding to that, we're, we're, we're doing that. The it's as Rupert said, some of the actions um, are really working out exactly what we need to do and starting to cost some of those out um, and put those forwards as in business cases or, or put the costs through to do them. But it's it's why the some of the actions are, are not necessarily saying exactly what we're doing. It's more making sure we, we put a appropriate um, plan in place, but it's 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 moving those forwards. Okay. Can I thank uh, both Rupert and Jason for their replies and, and, and just add that I do hope as much of this journey in terms of the meetings and progress uh, made against targets is put into the public domain because there's a lot of public interest in this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I certainly second that, that I hope we can be as transparent on that as possible and to, to, to pick up on these ideas that it's very much a living document and obviously one of our items in the action plan is to make sure that we stay engaged with that and get updates as that plan changes and um, to make sure we're getting it right. I have a couple of points I wanted to pick up in point five in the report. Uh, it says we're generating over 300 kilowatt hours per year um, of of solar. Is that one? Renewable energy. I think that should be megawatt hours, um, not kilowatt hours because that wouldn't be very much. Um, on the airport, and obviously the elephant in the room is that there is an outstanding uh, planning application that that has excited uh, a lot of issues and brings up a lot, but is of course a planning application that will be decided by ELAC uh, on planning grounds um, and is not really a discussion for now. I do think we need a principled approach to accounting for the emissions from the airport though, um, which correctly reflects the agency that we can exert and doesn't doesn't necessarily penalize us too hard for what is the geographic location of a of a a business of regional importance that of course uh, has carbon emissions that aren't attributed to to businesses or people within the borough uh, but that which does recognize that we we do potentially have some role in encouraging uh, uh, carbon reduction in, in some elements of, of the airport's operation. So I hope we can develop that and come up with a way that's sort of fair to everyone and helps us to judge our progress in a productive way. Um, I have all sorts of notes. The one thing that I quite like a discussion on is obviously we're proactively building houses. Uh, we all know that it's, a I think, the right and proper thing to do to do be delivering those homes for people um, and obviously we've set reasonably high uh, environmental standards around that in our own developments and where possible uh, as a planning authority. I wondered how um, discussions were going with things like the One Horton Heath team which understandably are big project teams, they're big investments for the council um, and how pragmatically we ensure that, that the council's aspirations around the environment are reflected uh, in those those big investments uh, and projects, do they, for instance, have a link uh, to the 
climate change board um, and and how how are those projects monitored and and if you like um, judged uh, on their success and um, I guess that's probably a question for Rupert and possibly Jason. So if I could ask Rupert to give us any thoughts or, or, or Jason, someone shout and I'll make you live, I guess. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I, I wasn't going to shout. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right uh, in, in the issues. Uh, sorry, the, the, the points that you've raised. Um, uh, clearly, with the one Horton Heath, I have had discussions with Paul Naylor about obviously waste collection, etc. on site, because obviously we are the in effect the master planner so obviously there are opportunities potentially to maybe do things differently or certainly look at the opportunity certainly look at the way things may be done slightly differently um and i know that these uh, other options are available um and being undertaken elsewhere in the country etc so um clearly as you know we want to be make it as a sustainable development as possible and clearly obviously the environment is incredibly important to that i think you're absolutely right there needs to be a link there um and i think there are when they the um whether the group are actually feeding into this i'm not 100 sure clearly they're obviously going to be aware of the strategy um, and action plan because obviously clearly that's obviously an overarching policy of the council now um but you're quite right i think that um there ought to be a link if there isn't one already uh to make sure that obviously we are taking all of the opportunities that we are that we possibly can to make sure obviously this this um, development delivers uh, all the sustainable and uh, uh ecological benefits that we would we want to see um, um, in in a um, in, in a development of this size where we do have such a, a control um, on what's being delivered, um, I'm sure that will be the case. Um, but clearly, we want to make sure that those checks and balances are in place to make sure that we are on board at the right times uh, to be able to influence that process. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll I'll hand over to Jason just in case um, I've said something that is clearly wrong. Uh, I apologise if that is the case. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but I would think I would like to make sure that there is a link there, um, and also onto other development applications or, or, or plans, etc., where we are able to influence. Clearly, obviously, we have a council policy. Um, we are looking at doing some work obviously on um, SPDs um, with regarding to uh, wanting to make sure we have biodiverse uh, net gain plus in my view or plus plus in my view um, and where we're obviously able to push that with the developer obviously clearly we want to do that the tree strategy as you very well know um, that's in uh, that's being put together now but clearly is also a very important factor within all of this and certainly uh, with regards to development um, where obviously development sometimes you have to lose trees very unfortunately um, either for access or for obviously um, developing parcels of land um, and clearly, obviously, there is a, um, a requirement for developers to replace trees, um, uh, you know, three for one or whatever the situation is. Um, we're obviously within our tree strategy coming forward. Um, Paul Naylor, obviously, and the tree officers are actually putting this together now. We're hoping that a draft will be available uh, in the very near future um, to be able to obviously look at and uh, hopefully bring that forward. Um, yeah, maybe to PMP and obviously then to cabinet, etc., um, to have a look at. But clearly, we want to be very aspirational with regards to trees, and clearly, obviously, development and how trees and the ecology and the environment sit together is really, really key and really important because it is about creating communities. Um, it's about place making, and I know there's a lot of work that's been going on on around that um, to make sure that what you're delivering is actually not only somewhere where people actually want to live, but people somewhere where it's actually really good, where we're able to. Um, live in harmony shall we say with our environment which clearly as I say when I spoke right at the beginning people have really started to embrace how important the environment actually is within their living environment or where they you know where, where they reside etc um, with regards to obviously uh, living but also um, recreation and uh, so yeah so um so yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. There does need to be a link there, um, but it is a wider piece as well, I think, um, with regards to development um, across the piece. Um, and um, so, yeah, I would obviously very much welcome if there's anything that Jason wants to say on this piece. But if not, um, clearly we can take that back to the to the board. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you, Rupert. Uh, Jason, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, Chair, that would be, that would be good. Um, just on the, you picked up on point five in the report. There, there was a slight type. There was a K missing in the, so it should have said three hundred thousand kilowatt hours. But you could change it to megawatt, or we can add the K in to kind of show that number. But the the numbers in the actual report are correct. They're just it's just the wording there. Yeah. Um, 
on on planning i mean obviously we we have quite a significant history around sustainable development in the borough um the the borough was one of the first councils in in pioneering use of um Briam communities which is a a master planning uh, approach um, which embeds sustainable development in at the, the kind of first outset and last time I checked we still had the highest score in the world for that that system with one of our developments um, and I, I haven't seen a development in my time that hasn't managed to meet the requirements around Brian communities so we, we start very early with with developments um, on the the kind of one Horton Heath the um, I think you'll note in the report it, it talks about housing and how that's a, a work program we've we've added to the the climate program um, to make sure there is that focus on on housing. Um, I've I've personally been involved in quite a number of discussions um, around different aspects of of the development site in One Horton Heath and and I've, I've I've actually got a meeting next week with the chief exec where we're talking about some of that. Um, to make sure we are we are picking up every opportunity and, and, and making sure it's embedded um so it's it's very much there and i think i think there was a report to cabinet um a few months ago which set out some of the principles for one horton heath and it it included um the environment quite heavily in that report alongside health and and economic benefits as well and creating that um really kind of positive community so it's it's absolutely there. It's it's ongoing discussions and um, looking for as many opportunities as possible on, on that on that development. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, so I'm going to move that we make a couple of recommendations. Uh, one is which um, that we that we come up with a way of of fairly accounting for emissions from the airport um, in this ongoing reporting and monitoring of our progress. Um, and the second that we ensure that there are uh, positive uh, and useful links between uh, the climate change board um, and our certainly our large housing projects. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to suggest any recommendations to go to cabinet along with this report. Um, just the points that I made about transparency uh, of the uh, of the board, please, if that's okay. appropriate. OK, thank you. Yeah, we can certainly add uh, point three that, um, that that the the board look at ways to uh, ensure they're being transparent and and to put the minutes and decisions into the public domain. Um, Jim, you put in chat that um, you'd vote against that first recommendation. I don't know. Do we want to have a little discussion about how you think we could improve it? Um, I, I don't support the idea of um, spreading the impact across the um, impacted area um, in the just don't think that personally I don't I don't think that's the right approach. OK, OK, um, would there be a, a counter approach you would suggest? I feel very nervous about the way that the airport has presented its carbon numbers. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, some very dodgy cal calculations shown in the um, pre-planning application um, exhibitions, um, saying that um, the carbon impact of somebody flying from Gatwick is greater than somebody flying from Southampton, making the huge assumption that the airline would then cancel mm -hmm. the flight from Gatwick because everyone going from Southampton, um, which clearly would, would be unlikely to be the case, although who knows in this new world. Um, but I just think that um, we should be upfront and transparent and very clear about um, the airport's emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to split them out, I won't support that. But I what I would like to see is the full emissions for the airport, including flights being shown, mm -hmm. even if you you want to go down the idea of we'll only set, set responsibility for a chunk of them. It's, we, it's making sure our calculations are, are clear, um, upfront, not hidden away. Um, if you want to then put a um, say a fraction onto that, that's I I wouldn't support that. But if that's if that's the way the the way this is felt, it be fairer. Then you obviously need to go that way. But I would still want to see that total number being shown. OK, I think that's a fair point. I think that's a very fair point. Um, and so we can we can think about the wording for that recommendation and that that it is perhaps that we are um, clear about how we model the airport's total emissions 
and that we have a way of accounting for them somehow uh, in our yeah. own monitoring. Yeah. Um, and then Cabinet will presumably at some point come back with that methodology and we can scrutinise it again. Um, I mean, because you want to see the um, the um, concern at the moment about tree felling taking place mm -hmm. over the boundary in Southampton as, yeah. as a result of activity by the airport. Um, <laughs> it's it's it is a big project. It does have implications beyond our boundaries, but I just think we should be as clear as we can be in how we present the information. OK, that's that's a very good point. Does anyone else want to join in on that discussion of any of those recommendations? Uh, Otherwise, I'm going to take them as agreed by the panel, not necessarily unanimously. Sarah wants to support uh, Jin's perspective. Um, Natalie, your advice on what the best process here is for minuting what we've decided and whether we need to um, have a recorded vote, but uh, Sarah would like to speak. Our uh, Chair, I feel, um, I realise I'm on ELAC and therefore I need to be a little bit careful where any discussion of the airport is concerned. Um, so, um, I think maybe it'd be better if you were going to push this uh, proposal. I, I I abstain rather than um, because uh, I th I think I might be a little compromised. Completely understandable and very sensible. Um, so, uh, Judith, you'd like to come in. You wait for your camera. Yes, I, I mean, Councillor Tyson Payne raises an important point, and of course, my understanding is that uh, the application is now not coming to Eastleigh. It's not going to be decided for some months now, um, and um, who knows? It may be that it ends up being decided at full council. So, you know, that would obviously affect all councillors. Yes, um, although I suppose to some extent the whether or not the runway is extended, um, we we should expect that the airport will still be there and producing emissions and that we will need to somehow account for those emissions in our climate change monitoring and reporting because our aspiration is to include all of the borough's uh, emissions within that. Um, so I think- Indeed, I, I just thought I'd mention it as Councillor Tyson Payne had, had raised that. So. Yes, that, that is a very good point, thank you. Um, but I, I, well, I'm going to move those three recommendations we've talked through, uh, with number one being that we just want a principled uh, way of modelling um, those emissions, um, including transparency about the total emissions and, if appropriate, uh, some way of um, apportioning them or some discussion of how that is done. Um, and as usual, uh, we, will, we will tidy up the wording on that uh, for the minutes. Um, but unless anyone else speaks now, I'm just going to take those as agreed and we will. Oh, Natalie says we can do a recorded vote if you don't all agree. Shall we do that for a bit of excitement? Natalie, can you talk us through that? Yes, I can. So I was remembering to unmute that time. Um, let me just bring up. The names. So what I'll do, I'll read the names off one by one and then just let me know how you're going to vote. Is the only one that you've got the the only one there's disagreement about, as far as I understand, is a, is about accounting for the emissions. Yes. Yes. Do we want to specifically agree that wording before we do the vote? Yes, we should, shouldn't we? So I said just the uh, wording is uh, that we ask, we recommend to Cabinet that um, future uh, reporting and monitoring of the um, climate change um, emissions and uh, actions include total uh, emissions from the airport and a methodology for, for working out what that is. Um, 
and a methodology for um, apportioning or understanding uh, Eastleigh Borough's um, role within that total number. OK, let me just read that back to make sure I've got that right. That future reporting and monitoring of climate change emissions and actions include total emissions from the airport and to work out what those are and proportioning the borough's role in that number. That sounds right to me. And then we're going to do a vote just on that first recommendation and then we'll think about two and three, but I propose we take them as a group unless anyone else shouts in the meantime. OK, um, I think we would. Do we need to move the camera or not? I think you do. Okay. We haven't at others. I think we left it on Laura. OK, that's fine. We'll do it like that. OK, so I shall start okay. with. Sorry, Did someone speak. No, OK, right, I'll, I'll start. I'll go down the list, the order that it is on the minute. So I'll start with you, Chair. Uh, I will vote in favour. OK, Councillor Cross. In favour. Councillor Asman. In favour. Councillor Broadhurst. Four. Councillor Caudry. Um, I'm standing on this one because I didn't quite fully understand it. OK. Um, Councillor Duguid. In favour. Councillor Gwareski. Four. Councillor Groves. In favour. Councillor Jurd. Four. Councillor Pragnall. In favour. Councillor Tidridge. Against. Councillor Tyson Payne, sorry, I missed you in the wrong order. It's OK, I, I, I'll abstain. OK. OK, so the four carries. Thank you very much um, and thank you for a good debate on that, everybody. I'm going to take those uh, recommendations two and three as agreed unless anyone says something in chat. No, those are agreed then. Thank you very much. That was a really good discussion um, and I look forward to that item coming back regularly for us to play an active role in, uh, which moves us on just to uh, the Cabinet Forward Plan and Work Planning. I'm going to share my screen because I had mocked up um, an outline of a work programme for us. Like I say, I think the big issue here is, can I even share my screen as a producer? Do you know where the button is? Yeah, I think it's the share button on the side. Mm. No, I'm not seeing one. We just do it verbally, that's OK. Um, my expectation is that we probably need to decide items, certainly for the July meeting, which is the next one, and I'll run through what I've currently got suggested. Have some idea for September, um, but beyond that, I think we need to play it by ear and ask actually where we can deliver value at the moment. Um, and some of that's going to be the COVID-19 recovery work, um, and some of it as things hopefully start to get back to normal, we'll be picking up all those things we picked up um, in the action plan, including um, public transport, for instance, um, and, and working that in as we have a bit um, more certainty. Uh, so we need to be a little bit agile this year, I think. Um, in terms of what I've currently got down for July, um, we had discussed the corporate action plan um, and we'd like that to come if it's ready. There is, I think, some uncertainty around whether that 
will be there. So we'll bring it if we can, but I don't think it can be guaranteed. Um, we'll have the performance data from the last two quarters, and that'll be a nice side by side comparison and give us some insight into the COVID-19 impact. Um, and I'm going to add a specific focus there to have some commentary on, on the impact of COVID-19 and any additional measures that will help us um, understand that. No. Um, tree planting policy slash strategy should be coming. Um, and we'll look forward to that. Uh, we will inquire about whether the new Ways with Waste project can give us um, some idea of what that project is seeking to achieve um, and the scope around that and the priority areas for that so that we can um, we can make any suggestions around things we, we'd like to see addressed. Um, and then I've got from our discussion earlier, potentially something around digital inclusion um, issues, and I'd suggest um, I take that away and think what it might entail. Um, so that's what we're working with at the moment uh, for the next meeting. Um, and then I think Rupert said he would like to speak on the work programme, so I'll bring you in now, Rupert. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a, a, an issue that has been uh, worrying me for a period of time. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of tease this out with yourselves at, on Policy Importance Scrutiny Panel about whether or not you might be interested uh, in uh, supporting uh, the concerns potentially that I have. And I certainly know that some residents have raised it and I know that some councillors are also very concerned. And this is actually the M27 M3 smart motorway project, which is currently underway. As you know, the M27 M3 uh, cuts or, or bisects the borough or goes through the borough um, and obviously uh, transports a huge amount of traffic uh, either uh, from you know, point A point to point B, etc., either across the borough or to further afield. My real concern is about the um, certain aspects of the work that's been undertaken. Um, for anyone who's actually drives that on a regular basis, even through the um, uh, lockdown period, um, you'll have seen the significant amount of um, uh, trees and um, uh, vegetation that has been cleared. Um, and when I say cleared, it literally has been wiped away uh, over that period of time. Significant amount of uh, environmental impact that this particular project is is has uh, as you will know they've taken it back all the way down all the way up to in effect the, the boundary fence which clearly will expose properties um, that are close to that um, boundary fence uh, in West End um, to higher levels of noise and potentially pollution as well which I know has upset some of those residents mm -hmm. um, there are issues uh, potentially therefore about noise um, there are issues potentially, which I know there have been programmes on the safety of smart motorways. Um, and I know that the Grant Shapps, I think, uh, who's the Secretary of State for Transport, said that they were undertaking a, uh, an interesting word, stock take uh, rather than review uh, into smart motorways. Uh, and it was revealed in the programme that a lot of the smart motorway network that has actually been implemented, very little of it actually has the smart technology that goes with it. Um, so therefore it raises significant safety concerns from my perspective um, and also there were issues about the frequency of the pull in bays if you were to have a, a, um, a breakdown etc. Um, and so there are lots of questions there which I'm very concerned about given that this is trundling through our uh, through our borough. Um, it has significant impacts. I was initially really concerned actually from the environmental perspective because um, given that last year they started some of the vegetation clearance um, during the nesting season so I therefore raised questions about why they were doing it in the nesting season. I was given uh, an assurance that they had all of the licenses necessary um, and an ecologist was therefore apparently on site whilst they were doing it however they were doing the vegetation clearance at night. Um, so given the density of the vegetation that they were clearing, which was not only immature trees, semi-mature trees of all different types, um, but also the uh, ground vegetation, which was quite significant as well, which has obviously clearly grown up over the years. I cannot believe, Chair, that no wildlife has either been disturbed or indeed lost uh, whilst they've been trundling through with their huge machinery, literally tearing trees out of the ground. And that's the only way I can uh, describe it. It's been 
tearing trees out of the ground. But also last year, which you know again raised real alarm bells to me, is that some of the um, trees that they'd actually cut down, they then left over the winter. So therefore they were creating another habitat for wintering um, uh, hibernating animals. And then of course then this year, start of the bird season again, they've started with their you know, huge machinery tearing out all of the um, all of the um, uh, greenery, etc. Which, as you say, if you drive down there, it's it is pretty pretty significant. You'll see. Um, there's also, as I say, issues of safety, the implementation of technology, the resurfacing issue. We were promised, as you well know, the quiet surface um, to be installed or or, or or to be implemented on the motorway. We've now been told that's not going to happen. Um, you know, clearly there was money apparently identified for this project to be able to um, totally resurface the road. Now, clearly that apparently isn't going to happen now. So there are issues, obviously, of noise relating to that, but also uh, concerns uh, that have been raised by residents about potentially also safety as well. So I was, I'm, I'm going to write a letter, and I've spoken to Council Area about it, writing a letter to the Secretary of State for Transport, copying and obviously the uh, CEO of Highways England, uh, raising the concerns on behalf of obviously the residents, myself, etc., and Councillor Airy relating to um, these concerns and wanting assurances about the, the points that have been raised to us. Um, and I was wondering whether a policy and performance might be interested in wanting this as an item on their um, uh, work programme <coughs> to potentially ask somebody from the Ministry of Transport or indeed Highways England to attend a session of policy and performance to actually answer some of the concerns that we have. And I was just wondering, really putting it out there to the committee and yourself, Chair, obviously, to see whether it's something you may want to support. Um, but certainly my concern has been there for a significant period of time while this work has been under underway um, and remains the, the, the case as well still. Um, and I would certainly like from a personal perspective as cabinet member some assurances about the issues that I've seen um, and clearly the mitigation in effect to the ecology, ecological environment impact of removing all of this um, vegetation. What is the mitigation plan from the Highways England to be able to replace some of the stuff that's already been lost? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rupert. So um, as you know, this is a an issue close to my own heart and, and, and I have received significant uh, amounts of correspondence about it. So I would support um, us extending an invitation to someone from Highways England or the Ministry of Transport uh, Department for Transport, whatever it is, uh, to come and talk us through some of that because it has been remarkably slow, I must say, and difficult to get any real clear answers and, and having a conversation with them could be the way to do that. Um, I think Judith wanted to speak on that. Yes, um, I, I, I fully agree with uh, Councillor Kell's suggestion that we ask Highways England, call them into uh, our, our committee so that we can put our questions to them across not, not just the, uh, um, the motorway itself, but all of the other issues. Um, I mean, we, I'm sure that he gets all of the bulletins weekly or however often they come that I do. Um, and they don't answer those questions. Um, they just tell us which junctions are going to be closed next and so on. So, yes, I, I think it's high time we uh, called them in and, um, and and not take no for an answer. Yeah, I completely agree, completely agree. Um, I propose that um, I, in, in conversation uh, with Councillor Curl, who is, who is, of course, writing uh, to them, uh, pursue getting them to come uh, either to one of our programmed uh, meetings or if need be to to an a, additional one uh, to come and help talk us through those issues and give us some answers. Um, other than that, does anyone have any comments on work planning? It doesn't look like it. That's great. So we will carry on with those plans uh, for July and then we will try and get um, Highways England programmed in as well, uh, which leaves me just to uh, close the meeting uh, to thank you all very much uh, for what has been actually a really good discussion this evening. I think that we've had some really substantive debate on things, so that's great. Our next meeting um, is Monday the 20th of July 2020. Uh, my agenda says it will be in Eastleigh House. I suspect it will definitely still be virtual, um, but I look very much forward uh, to seeing you all again then. Uh, and of course, to our four remaining attendees, thank you for tuning in. I know you've had to miss the one show uh, uh, to be with us, but uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. I'll close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, thank Chair. Bye-bye.